Dina Markovic, uh, who um, is here listed as a representative of the EU Center for European Studies. She's a PhD candidate in political science. Um, and also, she has a quite diverse uh, background. I remember that she's a published poet as well. So there's a lot of depth in this young person here. Um, and she will be to return to this. <laughs> I will try my best. I cannot promise, but I will certainly try. I remember uh, when I was, uh, I guess, a PhD student, and right afterwards, I tended to go much over that. Thank you, Jack, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers and the audience, first of all, for dragging me out of my office at, um, from the Parliamentary Triangle um, in Canberra. And it's very nice to be in, in Melbourne. Of course, every time one gets here, realizes what we are missing out in the capital city of Australia. Um, my hat today is the ANU. I represent the ANU Centre for European Studies, which is a blue cottage um, on, on the ANU campus. However, I, I'm Europe Senior Europe Analyst in the Australian Parliament. Um, I'm also Vice President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs branch in Canberra. I have many other hats, um, such as the Eurovision organizer um, in Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> today, is, today is my most proud achievement today. Um, and this is actually um, a shot in Canberra. Um, this is uh, an EU balloon. I think um, Andrea would probably know the history of the balloon much better than I. Uh, but um, as an annual Eurovision charity, Eurovision organizer, the only charity <laughs> in Australia, um, the European Commission has over the years provided amazing assistance. And the top prize for the best dressed uh, Australian Eurovision fan is actually arrived on this. Oh. Program. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's worth over $600. So it's absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. I'm counting on your help this year as well. <laughs> um, I have actually changed my presentation after listening to many of your questions over the past um, few days, but I will uh, stick to kind of audiovisual um, aid assistance from, from iPhone and a couple of quotes from here and there. Um, I would like to talk about four main topics. This is um, the images of the EU in Australia. As we have heard from today's presentations and, and over the past few days, there are many myths, um, historical narratives which have been socially constructed uh, which we are trying to deconstruct, but this is a, is a feature of not only foreign affairs and international politics, but everyday life. We base our opinions um, and are influenced by a multitude of factors. Why are perceptions important? Well, in my PhD work, I believe, and many um, analysts would agree, that perceptions actually influence foreign policy decisions, decisions in general. But um, if you feel closer to A, partner A, uh, less than to partner B, you are more likely to be open negotiate and conduct business and overcome hurdles with partner A than with partner B. Um, and therefore, perceptions are very important. And um, us, the three universities you see represented here, plus a university in New Zealand, uh, we are a consortium of four universities which are funded by both the governments of, of these two countries, but um, most importantly, the European Commission. And um, we have investigated over these universities the perceptions which the EU has in the Asia Pacific region and more so in Australia. Now it's very interesting to see how um, Australian parliamentarians are changing their perceptions of the EU over the years. And um, I will also then talk about hidden aspects of the relationship which people normally are not aware of or it's not very much publicized in the media. Parliamentary relationship and cooperation is a very, very fundamental part of the exchanges between um, Europe and Australia. Uh, people to people links and state governments. Now, no one has really mentioned much uh, this element of the relationship, but state governments and even local governments have a very interesting connection to Europe and to European Union in particular. And I will also try in my very brief time to provide you with some practical tools. How would you do conduct your own research on the European Union and Australia relationship? Um, how would you advise your students? Because this is very important. And one question is resources. Where do I I mean, Google and Wikipedia, I would say, is a false friend, especially Wikipedia. It can provide you with an indication of an answer, but you do not cite Wikipedia in any serious um, discussion. So avoid, avoid and uh, advise your students to use it only as a guide. Um, you guys are actually more important than you think. Your role is fundamental. Um, we are living in the so-called Asian century. The Australian education reform is, is underway. A lot of funding is given to the study of um, Asian languages as, 
as a graduate of European languages and in Australia, we did not even have $100 to actually record lectures for one of my subjects. So the funding for EU language study in Australia has been in decline for the past 10 years or so. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the new education overhaul, but um, therefore high school teachers have a kind of more continuous role to play because at that level I think the funding might stay, but at the university level it really is, um, it's, it's, some, someone's mentioned, um, it's a business. So wherever the highest demand is, that is likely to drive um, the future reform there. So we really don't know what's going to happen in this area, but that's why you guys have a very, very important role to play. Not only in language study, in history study, but why should we study EU? Why are EU Australia relationship um, and other facets of this relationship important? Well, you guys need to prepare Australians to deal with EU in the future. The world looks very different now from 50 years ago, uh, 51 years now, um, from the time when we formed um, kind of an official relationship with the EU. In 1962, um, we appointed a diplomat to Brussels, Sir Edwin um, McCarthy, who um, arrived in 1962 in Brussels. And Australia's Attorney General and Acting External Affairs Minister at the time, Sir Garfield Barwick, said, the government's appointment of Sir Edwin McCarthy was prompted by the circumstance that this country has a very great interest in what happens in this organization in Europe. Um, and he said that in 1960. This indicates that the dialogue with the EU, um, at the time it was called differently, the EU has changed its name a few times, but we use today the term EU to refer to its predecessors as well. Um, the idea of the United States of Europe is actually not new. Um, in 1923, the Austrian count, um, uh, Kalergi, founded the pan-European movement. So following the First World War, we still had the League of Nations at the time, there were these movements which sprang up and they believed that Europe is going to be stronger if it is united. Um, Mr. Kalergi said in 1923, Europe as a political concept does not exist. The biggest obstacle to the accomplishment of the United States of Europe is the 1,000 years of ri old rivalry between the two most populated nations of pan-Europe, Germany and France. Um, and now we are standing here many, many decades later and the world looks very different. Therefore, we need to learn how to deal with an integrated EU which has a strong international voice which I would argue has a foreign policy. A lot of realist scholars would argue whether the EU actually has a foreign policy. Well, I believe it does, and certainly EU and the UN has over 1,000 coordination meetings a year to <coughs> try and um, kind of smooth out differences and also to present a unified voice in global institutions. Um, these coordinated meetings actually um, usually result in, in a common position, not on all issues, but on over 90% of issues uh, in the UN. Therefore, not just the EU 27 member states, but there are also other countries, such as the candidate countries, which support common <coughs> EU positions in the United Nations. Therefore, for Australia, Australia is a like-minded nation, with the EU as an entity, however, we might have different opinions certain, on a certain issue internationally. Therefore, how do we engage with the United European Union in the 21st century? Um, there are many different images of the EU and more broadly, obviously, Europe in Australia and in the world. Um, we often have a very romanticized world of Europe, and usually, you know, Italy, of course, you know, the romantic land where all of us go once in our lives to find something, whether it's love for cooking, love for another person, love for something, or <laughs> chase our own passions, love for gelati, you know. Um, so it, it's a very, we have a romanticized view, not only of history, but of kind of the so-called old and slowly new Europe as well. There is also, um, like um, Andrea said, there is also another aspect of Australia's relationship with the EU, which is kind of the carrot and stick approach. Over many years, since the 60s, we actually disagreed a lot with the, e with the EU. Again, I'm using the EU also for, United, uh, for European communities and European community. Um, Prime Minister um, Sir Robert Menzies expressed in particular reservations about the future of the Commonwealth of Nations following Britain's application to join the EU. Britain actually joined in 1973 alongside two other countries. However, it tried twice before but was vetoed by France. Um, um, Australian foreign policy actually developed in a kind of a very, very different way from what it was conceived after the Second World War. 
um, after Britain joined the EU. And this was because of the preferential trade agreement which Australia as a member of the Commonwealth of Nations had with Britain. We had a special preferential trading agreement. Um, it allowed us to send agricultural experts to um, not just Britain, but the Commonwealth of Nations with very, very um, kind of, um, with, with not many taxes. So the rates were fantastic. However, um, after Britain joined the EU, this preferential, uh, preferential trade arrangement was abolished for us. It wasn't abolished for New Zealand. They said, we are really small, we need this um, sort of assistance of some kind to stay. So for Australia, it was a massive shock. Australian polit politicians felt abandoned. You know, Mother Britain has abandoned us. We are kind of an orphan now. And in that particular year, Australia recognized China. And that was very interesting. So our foreign policy and trade policy diversified and turned towards um, China and Asia. Before that was Japan, but that was kind of the opening of our China relationship. And we really need to thank the EU for that. Now China is our <laughs> number one trading partner. And because they stole our mother Britain from us, we found another surrogate mother. And that was um, in the trading relationship later on proved to be very beneficial. Um, this agreement between Australia and the European community continued over several decades, and we even formed the so-called CANS group, and we had a permanent chair, which was established in 1986, which called the, for the total elimination of government subsidies for agriculture. Um, often media, as, as several speakers have said, um, likes to attack um, the EU on, on, for example, this particular issue. However, there was a continuous development of the relationship parallel to our disagreements, which often goes unnoticed. Um, the Europe, European community and the European Union today is not anymore, as the cliche says, an economic, economic giant but a political war. It is actually becoming um, a global power, and it, I would argue it is a global power. And um, the failure to grasp that in Australia can only <coughs> lead us to be one step behind the EU in many, many ways. Um, in my research, I tried to capture diplomatic stories and diplomatic perceptions. Um, the, one of the most famous conceptions of the EU of today is that the EU is a metrosexual superpower. <laughs> <laughs> and this was written in Foreign Policy in 2004 by a scholar called Parag Khanna. And he said he was comparing how the US foreign policy is driven by realist kind of military strategy, whereas the EU foreign policy, on the other hand, is driven by a soft power approach. Um, and in particular, he said, um, brand Europe is taking over from environmental sustainability and international law to economic development and social we welfare. European views are more congenial to international tastes and more easily exported than their US variants. Um, even the Bush administration's strategy towards the greater Middle East is based on the Helsinki model, which was Europe's way of integrating human rights standards into collective security institutions. Furthermore, regional organizations such as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Mercosur, and the African Union are redesigning their institutions to look more like the EU. Um, certainly, the EU's uh, influence in Asia has risen over the past decade. The EU did not have a United China strategy until about seven years ago or so. Uh, there were 13 different strategies of the EU, for example, towards China. The EU now has a one China strategy. Australia in this way is used um, as a model and as a lesson for the EU. A lot of EU scholars, uh, researchers, and, and employees are coming to Australia to see how are we engaging with Asia and why are we so successful in particular in education? Why are we so successful in exporting education to Asia? So there is a lot of um, knowledge transfer happening between the EU and Australia. Again, this is not very well publicized. Often we hear, see images like this, you know, the EU is drowning, the Greece is falling apart, civilization that made Europe is going to end it, and so on, of course, Greece. Um, however, despite all the economic difficulties, we have a very strong macroeconomic dialogue um, with the EU. How can you guys benefit, and how can maybe your, um, your areas benefit from EU-Australia dialogue in this sphere? Well, I'm not sure how many of you know, but there is actually a sister, sister to sister, city sisters program, and friendship program. Um, I quickly did some research, and um, actually, we are slacking off a little bit, but Sydney is probably uh, the fairest of field. It has sister city program with Florence and Portsmouth in the UK, and friendship city cities program with Athens, Berlin, Dublin, and Paris. Um, 
Brisbane, actually, interestingly, cut its um, friendship pro program with, um, with Nice in um, 1995 as a, a result of the French uh, resumption of nuclear testing in the Pacific. And this was seen as a retaliation <coughs> against um, the French position at the time. Um, and Darwin has none. So there are a couple of places in Australia which really need to reinvigorate this program. What does this mean? Well, this is the local government initiative. Uh, Melbourne has, um, and Perth has as well, with, with in particular Greek cities. So uh, this is a mayor to mayor dialogue program, and they can actually bring not only schools, but also religious uh, classes, choirs, cultural kind of institutions together at, at the local level. And the question is, you know, how much do local governments invest in this? Do they really do anything? How can you apply for funding for this? Um, Australia has actually been selected by the EU for this year to be um, uh, its partner for the Cultural Cooperation Program. Again, not many people knew in Australia, and the European Commission has confirmed this, that there were 200,000 euro projects literally vacant because initially not many people knew about it and they didn't know how to apply, it seemed very complicated. Therefore, I would encourage not only yourselves but also your students for information to approach um, European delegations, to approach different EU missions via email, of course, in, in Canberra. If you need teaching material, you never know, there might be you know, something which could be useful to, to your <laughs> students to kind of touch and feel a little bit more tangibly. You know, don't forget that there is this resource which sometimes remain, remains um, untapped and it exists and it is there for, for all of us to, to communicate um, with these missions. Um, so that was that. Um, interestingly, you know, yesterday we had, it, or the first day we had the story that, um, or um, more actually, um, Russia has this image of, you know, we are okay. unique. Well, actually, we have it, and I myself experienced it when I went across your body, yeah, but it's better than Australia. Oh my god, you, know, you guys are so outdated. Where is technology? Where is Wi Fi? And so on. But um, <laughs> we do have that sometimes um, as well. So we are all guilty a little bit of our own kind of national atmosphere, in my case. I don't know, bias of some kind. Um, but yeah, we are great in Australia, however, <laughs> we do need to, to acknowledge that we have a lot to learn from the EU uh, countries, institutions, uh, universities, schools, and really we are not using online learning enough. Americans are doing very well in this regard. Americans are connecting across America with you know, schools to schools, even overseas. I think we have a lot to learn from the US, EU cooperation in this regard and try and maybe engage in some <coughs> online conversation more with EU schools, and that I'm sure Commission can also uh, help with in, in some way. Um, I've written, you know, a 75-page document on the history of EU-Australia relations, so if you're interested, you know, Parliament of Australia website. Um, but um, a common myth was that the Conservative government, which came after the whole Keating government, um, was made mostly by disagreements. However, in my analysis, I found that during the Howard government, that was the biggest expansion of our relationship with the EU, which continued into, into the Labour government. Um, and this is kind of the breadth of our relationship with the EU. We really have moved on a lot, and we are, you know, doing a lot of things by trial and error. We're learning to, to, um, to engage more closely, even though we may have different opinions and different positions, especially on on kind of um, you know Asia Pacific affairs because we are Asia Pacific is our uh, kind of near north and for Europe it has always been far east so we have a very different perception of Asia. Um, five minutes, okay. Thank you. Um, in terms of security, security after 9/11, the terrorist attacks on the U.S. Um, security became a dominant narrative in, in a lot of um, countries around the world. Um, Australia and the EU actually commenced at the secu security slash closer strategic dialogue, um, which has evolved a lot since 2001. Um, in 2007, in February, we have signed, um, the Australian Federal Police has signed an agreement with Europol. We are a third country, so the EU sees us as a third state. Obviously, we're not an EU member state, so we wouldn't get top level intelligence. Likewise, they wouldn't get our top level intelligence. However, the dialogue is not only initiated, it has been formalized. We have a person from the AFB 
um, station at your colleagues. So I, I'm pretty sure it was a one person posting with some additional resources if required. So we are talking about security, exchanging um, intelligence and um, certain levels of information. Um, in terms of infrastructure and transport, we are a bit slow on the aviation markets. So I think the progress has been quite slow because we have different positions on certain uh, on certain issues. However, maybe the current currently negotiated treaty between EU and Australia might address some of that. So we are in the most exciting stage of, of kind of negotiations at the moment. Um, this will be uh, the final stage. We're all hoping, and this treaty will be the most comprehensive agreement ever signed between. Um, us too. Um, in recent, over the recent uh, years, um, cooperation in education, science, and technology has been um, improved. Uh, both Ludmila and I were recently in Rome. I was there for seven months, but a little bit longer, I think. And we were the beneficiaries of this scheme: EU Australia um, PhD and postdoc students uh, and postdoc kind of exchange. Uh, we can do better. You know, we're doing very well, but I think at the high school level, that is something that can be addressed better. For example, I studied Italian and German in, in high school in Australia. Um, I've only got to encounter with the EU once, with the EU lingo and EU concept once I actually went and exchanged to Germany. So that there was no EU as part of my German language or Italian language study whatsoever. Um, so that is something that could be addressed and it's not a difficult task to address. So basically we need to look at the EU-Australia relationship in a critical way and highlight areas of, you know, of a great cooperation, but also where we need uh, to be more skeptical, perhaps, and areas where we need to do better. So there is a lot more dialogue that needs to be encouraged. Um, these are the current trends um, in our relationship. We have many, many shared values on global issues, but also on other issues, regional issues in particular. Uh, we are promoting human rights standards across the Asia Pacific together. Actually, Australia and the EU have entered into this very interesting arrangement, whereas um, the EU has delegated Australian aid to a country in Africa, and we have delegated some of their aid to Fiji, um, through churches, I'm pretty sure. So it was a, it's a very interesting arrangement. Australia, for Australia, it's very new that our you know, money is being, the aid money is being distributed to another partner, an entity rather than an organized kind of NGO. Um, and for the EU, it's also very, very exciting in the Pacific. We're both learning from each other in this regard. And the new part of the new agreement will reveal more details on what is going to happen on this front. Um, cooperation and aid and civil emergencies was also mentioned by the previous speaker, so I won't um, talk much about that. Um, some analysts are suggesting that we should really enter into an FTA with the EU. Now, we have heard some kind of arguments pro and against that position. Um, strategic partners is, is certainly an option and we are one of the so-called strategic partners as a third country for the EU. However, this strategic partnership needs to be more substantiated. Um, what is going to happen on the trade front uh, when it comes to the investment? There was an investment treaty being discussed. Um, however, the European Parliament now needs to um, not only approve new investment treaties with the third countries, but also there is a human rights provision which will be and has to be included in <coughs> any investment treaty by the EU with another third country. In 1996, this was a massive um, issue between our government um, and, and the EU, and we have actually not included that um, provision, but at that time it wasn't as compulsory for the EU as it is now. So that's probably one area of concern, and we don't know how this issue is going to be resolved in the current round of negotiations, hopefully to the benefit of both of us. The current treaty, proposed treaty, is also actually needs to be ratified by both parliaments, so the Australian parliament and the European parliament, as far as I'm aware. And this is making the task of diplomats even harder. You not only need to negotiate in good faith and on very difficult issues, but once it's put before the parliament, it's, it's going to be very, very, uh, it's, it's a different ball game. Um, I have a little quiz for you. A very little quiz, very short one. Um, and this quiz is not really to test your knowledge, but to show you the, the variety of resources you can resort to. Um, when was Australia's first ambassador sent to the European communities? 
However, it's in a fantastic pointer towards other resources. So you will go to the IFET website. What is the problem with that? Well, every time the government changes, some speeches are archived. However, many are actually you know, moved across to throw over another resource, and you can't find any more. Um, European delegation website, EU delegation, I found it extremely useful, sometimes more than the IFET website. Um, but there is also a service provided by the Australian Parliament which is open to everyone, it's called Parliament for Search and it contains all statements by all ministers and uh, basically parliamentarians since 1901 onwards and has been digitized um, and often you will find more speeches there and that is open to the public, it's, it's, you would always go to advanced search though and they pick the right boxes. Trove is a National Library of Australia um, service and they capture websites and that is something I would really encourage you all to use. They also have Sydney Morning Herald archives if you want to look at images of Europe um, pre-1965. Kind of you have a lot of articles for free available there. Um, EU legal database is something if you want to know how many agreements do we have with the EU, you wouldn't really try and second guess that. You would go to the, the best way is to go to the EU legal database, EU Lex, and then select Australia and then um, see how many are listed there. What commodities will we export to the EU? Um, also Australian different websites, however keep in mind that some of their immediate information is literally deleted after or archived but you can't access it after the election. However, you would look at annual reports. So encourage your students to engage with government material. Some of it I never knew about until I came to my master's degree and you know I felt a bit embarrassed about that, but I was never encouraged to look into those those type of resources. Uh, how many Europeans um, hold EU nationality in Australia? That's probably a bit hard to, to know. But um, how many there are in Australia? You would go to the ABS census data and so on. So these are just some of the resources I would encourage you and potentially for you, your students to use because they're underutilized. And I do look forward to your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much.